You've heard of ratatouille. But have you heard of ratatouille? What about Little Bee, Metal Man, Atlantic Rim, or Snakes on a Train? Welcome to the world of Mockbusters. The Mockbuster business relies on deception. But they aren't to be confused with twin films or those triple X rated films found in the dark corner of the local DVD store. Mockbusters are their own genre. These slightly ripped up versions of tentpole films are strategically released within days of the actual blockbuster's release in hopes of capitalizing on that film's publicity. And while that sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen, they're actually entirely legal, thanks to some pretty sneaky tactics. The year was 1954. Universal Pictures released the sci-fi thriller, Creature from the Black Lagoon. And it was a smash hit. One of the things that made the movie so popular was the impressive creature suit, designed by Jack Kevin, which gave the film its monstrous appeal. The suit was undoubtedly the standout star of the film. And yet when the credits rolled, Kevin's name was noticeably absent from the list. He wasn't the only artist that Universal Pictures had snubbed from the credits. Wayne Berwick, an uncredited dialogue editor, started to get fed up with this perceived disrespect. So Berwick and Kevin teamed up to create their own independent studio to make their own films where they could make sure they got the credit they deserved. Their first project was a Creature from the Black Lagoon ripoff. Kevin knew he could make an aesthetically compelling monster fast by using molds he saved from past works. The film they made was called The Monster of Piedras Blancas. Like the original movie, the monster of Piedras Blancas is centered on the discovery of a creepy creature that emerges from the waters and terrifies a small town. The monster of Piedras Blancas scored less than stellar reviews, but that doesn't mean it was a failure. The film launched a new genre of movies. The Mockbuster. There are hundreds of knockoff films that take ideas from movies you probably watch, like Jaws and E.T. Mockbusters, like any knockoff product, imitate stories from blockbusters, but are produced much differently. Blockbusters spend millions of dollars on production, while mockbusters tend to stick to a much tighter budget. The film is also made from start to finish in a much shorter time frame, anywhere from three to four months. Of course, the resulting movie is less than Oscar worthy. These films often go straight to DVD or are distributed online. Viewers hate mockbusters and most garner poor reviews, which means they also barely make any profit. Production companies continue to roll them out, but why? If they spent half a million and they made a million, that's good. They made half a million dollar profit. You know, I, I mean, they pay very, very, very low amounts of money to the people who work on those movies. They keep their budgets really low and, you know, they may do movies for just a few hundred thousand. So you don't have to sell that much to get a profit. During the 1990s and 2000s, the mockbuster industry exploded. Some of the most popular ripoffs of this time period were animated Disney movies that were largely produced by Good Times Entertainment. Good Times wasn't even trying to be sneaky about it. It released several Disney mockbusters with the exact same title as its blockbuster counterparts. This included The Little Mermaid, Pocahontas, Beauty and the Beast, and Cinderella. As you can see, these films had nearly identical covers in hopes of getting consumers to mistakenly rent the mockbuster in stores instead of the original. Imagine that surprise once you finally got all the way back home and put it in the DVD or VHS player. As you can guess, this angered Disney. So in 1993, it decided to sue Good Times Entertainment following its mockbuster release of Aladdin. This case brought mockbusters into a legal spotlight. The whole genre was depending on the outcome of this case. Disney argued that consumers have been misled and have contacted us directly. 
We feel that such parasite product is causing confusion. Which, yeah, that was the point of a good mockbuster. However, Good Times had a good defense. Disney does a lot of movies that are based on public domain stories. Alice in Wonderland, Snow White, Aladdin. So anyone could make a Aladdin movie. And so people go, oh, Aladdin is coming out. I will do my own Aladdin movie. As for the similar cover art, the judge said a general resemblance between the two was not enough to bring any charges. If Disney wanted to make a case, the packages for all of its own films had to be consistent. Good Times also stated most retailers were careful to advertise the difference between the films, and some put up signs to say it wasn't the real movie. In one of the most surprising twists of the time, the judge ruled against Disney, and Good Times emerged not just unscathed, but victorious. But even stories not in the public domain, like Ratatouille, are available for Mockbuster Studios. Ideas uh, for movies are not protected. Just the basic idea is not protected. What we, we talk about is the expression of that idea, how that idea plays out in terms of plot, character, dialogue, scene setting, themes and moods. And, and so it's a, you know, it's a very subjective issue of wh where, where you cross the line, but just the initial idea alone is not enough. This legal loophole is how mockbusters get away with producing knockoffs. Although Ratatouille and Ratatouille are both about rats cooking in restaurants, the similarities in the eyes of the law stop there. In Ratatouille, the main character is a rat named Remy in Paris, while Ratatouille stars Marcel in Rio de Janeiro. Mockbusters can even get away with using the exact same titles, even for stories outside of the public domain like Aladdin or Cinderella. Titanic 2 and this version of Journey to the Center of the Earth were all produced in recent years. Under trademark law, you can't trademark the title of a single work. And so if there's a movie put out by the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, they have their own internal system to regulate titles and they, they don't allow movies with similar titles to be released uh, within a certain period of time and they have their own arbitration system to, to judge those issues. But the mockbusters do, are not members of the MPAA, so they're, they go around that. However, once a movie turns into a series, like Harry Potter, for example, it becomes protected. But trademark law against a single work doesn't always hold up in court. In 2012, Warner Brothers sued Asylum, a mockbuster film company, for producing a version of The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey. The knockoff was titled Age of the Hobbits. At the time, it was a single project that only later became a series, so Asylum was within the single title legal loophole. When brought to court, Asylum argued that the Hobbits in its movies were based on the generic fantasy creature and not the specific Lord of the Rings version of the characters. Therefore, it should fall under fair use. The judge did not buy it and instead ruled in favor of Warner Brothers saying, there is substantial likelihood that consumers will be confused by Age of the Hobbits and mistakenly purchase the film intending to purchase The Hobbit in Unexpected Journey. The court ordered Asylum to immediately stop distribution, which it did. But that didn't stop it from creating mockbusters altogether. In recent years, the company has produced films like Homeward and knockoff of the Pixar movie Onward and Triassic World based on Universal's Jurassic World. There's really nothing Disney or the big studios can do to stop them. For the most part, they let it go. Also because they don't want to give them any publicity. It's almost like, you know, uh, the mosquito on the elephant. They're there, they're annoying, but at the end of the day, Disney's still making a billion dollars on their movie. But times have changed since the first mockbusters were released. During the genre's peak in the 1990s and 2000s, mockbuster companies relied on consumers picking the wrong movie off DVD rental store shelves. These stores largely went out of business once streaming came along, making it much harder for mockbuster companies to dupe people. It's a little harder to, to see them because they don't show up in your main pay-per-view slot because I don't think Amazon or, or uh, Apple want to promote those movies. 
they get too much money from the uh, from the big guys. Today, most mockbusters just end up on YouTube. But DVD sales and YouTube views just don't generate the same amount of money. While the genre seems to have potentially dark days ahead, for now, an audience for them exists. So when the next movie you're super excited to see comes out, make sure you don't accidentally rent the knockoff like Tabby Toes or Chop Kick Panda. Thanks for watching. If you want more stories like this, check out our new show, Who Knew, on Cheddar's TV network. It airs every Wednesday at 8 p.m. as part of our Originals Hour.